Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session on how the UK can drive net zero innovation and clean free trade. Um, my name is Rosa Stewart. I'm from the Conservative Environment Network. And for those of you who don't know SEN, SEN is an independent forum for conservatives who support conservation and decarbonisation. And we have lots of events across the party conference and I'm uh, very pleased that you're all here and also those of you who have uh, dialed in online. Uh, today we have an amazing panel covering this topic. Uh, we will hear uh, opening remarks from the panellists and then there will be audience Q&A uh, afterwards. And uh, if you would like to tweet, please do tag us at SENHQ and use the hashtag uh, SEN at CPC. Now, today's topic is quite broad. We will start off covering uh, clean uh, free trade and particularly important now when the UK is outside the European Union and we are negotiating independent free trade agreements and have a real opportunity to look at how climate policy and trade policy marry up and support each other. And then we will move on to broader topics of net zero innovation, domestic regulation and how to really create the incentives to turbocharge innovation to help us deliver net zero. Uh, but without further ado, we'll kick off. Uh, very pleased to have uh, Anna-Marie Trevelyan, Secretary of State for International Trade, who will be here for the first uh, part of the meeting. You're very busy. We know, very happy that you're here uh, delivering the opening statement um, and very much look forward to hearing your thoughts on uh, green exports, clean free trade, and uh, maybe some hints on the latest in government thinking that you can, you can share. I'm sure the audience would love to hear. So thank you very much. We're over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's lovely to be here and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I've got the uh, great joy of having gone from being Energy Minister to being International Trade Minister just in time for conference, which has its, has its moments, but it's all, it's all good. But I think for those of you or anyone who's ever in any doubt, climate change isn't only a top priority for the Prime Minister, it's also a huge priority for me personally. Um, and when the PM asked me to lead on the Adaptation Resilience Campaign for COP26 uh, this time last year. I was really delighted to accept, and it's been an extraordinary journey for me alongside my, if you like, day job of being the en Energy Minister uh, up until two weeks ago, um, because this is, without doubt, one of the biggest challenges that we face. And now, Britain's prosperity in the 19th century was founded on ingenuity, on entrepreneurialism, and, of course, on an abundance of carbon. So given the great challenges that we face today, it's only right that Britain's future prosperity will be enhanced by decarbonisation. Um, as I said in my speech yesterday, an industry that contains the businesses and entrepreneurs of tomorrow. So through the drive to net zero, we're asking people to do things differently and we're promoting policies that will support that objective. It's going to create new markets, new products and new possibilities. And this, of course, is a huge opportunity for the UK to capture those jobs, those skills, that technology, and, of course, the economic benefits that will come from this transformation. Because, of course, if we don't move first, we'll find ourselves left behind. So, crucially, those areas and regions that stand to benefit are the same, interestingly, as those that benefited in that last industrial revolution, but then suffered as a result of deindustrialization. So, uh, the government in the UK have really strong credentials, uh, to lead the way on this international clean recovery. Uh, in 2019, we became the first major economy to pass a legislative target to reach net zero gas emissions by 2050. Uh, we also doubled our international climate finance commitments for 21, years 21 through 25 to 11.6 billion pounds. That's still a world leading figure and we're encouraging others to do the same. And of course, finally, and it's my name on the ticket, for better or worse, uh, I set the world's most ambitious climate change target by bringing into law Carbon Budget 6 uh, to reduce emissions by 78% by 2035 compared to 1990 levels. And it is literally my wet signature on that. So I feel unbelievably uh, responsible, excited and challenged by how we actually deliver that as a government. Um, that sixth carbon budget will take us three quarters of the way to re reach reaching net zero by 2050. But it is a hugely ambitious and challenging target. So of course, last year, the Prime Minister set out his 10 point plan. And I know everyone in the room will be able to quote it back to me. Um, 
really importantly, we also announced that uh, we would no longer provide any direct financial or promotional support for fossil fuel energy sectors overseas. And actually, really interestingly, we've seen China make a similar commitment just a few weeks ago, and that's a really interesting step as part of our global challenge and our, our UK global leadership in this space, that they too, uh, even though they have uh, you know, many, many interests in that space, have decided that is also something they need to move towards. Uh, I think you know, the, the global family understands the challenges that we face. But I think the UK has world-leading capabilities uh, from offshore wind to smart energy systems, sustainable construction, uh, precision agriculture, green finance, nuclear technologies, and electric vehicle manufacture. So I am now, I have been moved by our Prime Minister to take all of this extraordinary talent, this extraordinary ingenuity and leadership, and share it with the world. International trade is all about making sure that UK, UK goods and services are out there as far as they can be, reaching far and wide through our export markets. Uh, and it is a really, really exciting proposition to be able to take that out there and share that, not only because we will see all the uh, benefits of that, and if we hold those world-leading talents, we will, we will see the UK uh, benefit financially, but because we need to be supporting countries around the world in their efforts to also tackle climate change, whatever their challenges are, and they know and are wanting the UK to be at the heart of helping them to deliver that. So I think we have some really exciting times ahead, and I look forward to working with all of you to achieve it. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that opening statement, and really uh, love the way you said, you know, you've got your signature in, in there on that target, that gives you some personal commitment. It just makes me think we should get more politicians signing up than, you know, with, a, um, with their own hand, and that hopefully gives us the commitment we need. Um, we'll ask a couple of questions uh, from me and a couple of maybe from the audience if we have time, but let me, let me kick off. Um, you obviously in your current role and previous roles have talked to a lot of uh, foreign governments uh, about energy and, and climate, and how much do you feel how much can UK, as, as one country, how much can we really influence others? And what, what have you found are the kind of arguments and uh, things that kind of where the penny drops in a meeting where you feel like, now I've, I've got them, they, uh, they understand me and uh, the climate action and, and uh, clean trade and all the rest of it? So I think a number of uh, areas, as you say, I've been um, uh, out and about. So interestingly, with my cop hat on, I've been out and about really with developing countries uh, working with them to encourage them to uh, produce their nationally determined contributions, even though for the vast majority of that involves conditional decisions, which would be, well, we would build solar farms, but only if someone can come and bring in with investment to help us do it, because we don't have the financial capacity, um, right through to those uh, countries where, you know, they're already carbon negative. You think of somewhere like Gabon. Uh, but the, what they want to do is be world-leading and make sure that they are driving the agenda and the frameworks that the UNFCCC system brings, which will ensure that the value they bring to our planet is both financed and can be made best use of. Um, so the really interesting challenge has been, not only in trade, one of the things I've found in many countries has been the sense that the UK has been absent from exporting its expertise for a long time. And you know, we now have the opportunity now that we have uh, put ourselves into a genuinely free trading position now that we've come out of the EU, that we need to really get on and get out into those countries and bring those amazing UK products and services to those countries who are wanting to work with the UK rather than any other country. It's a really powerful message that I've heard again and again. So I now have the opportunity with my new hat on uh, to get out and do exactly that. But I think we must, mustn't underestimate how respected uh, UK innovation, UK businesses, UK legal frameworks, our honesty in the way we do contracting, absolutely will be critical to ensuring that those countries that need support to deliver their clean energy solutions have us at the heart of that, because other countries are not necessarily going to provide the same support that they need. Really, thank you. Um, let's, uh, let's take a question from the audience. Yeah. We can probably hear me. Let's take a question from the um, audience uh, next. Is anyone wanting to put their hand up to ask uh, a question? A microphone just coming behind you. Hello, uh, Patrick from the Press Association. Um, some, some tweets have emerged recently, Secretary of State, suggesting that you were less than convinced about man-made 
climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, today you've called it one of the greatest challenges mm -hmm. the country faces. Uh, what's changed your mind? So I think I'm much like most other ordinary citizens. 10, 11, 12 years ago, um, I wasn't particularly focused on it. I was busy bringing up kids, running three businesses, living in Northumberland, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the, the vagaries of normal life. Uh, not a politician, uh, wasn't even on my radar at that point. Um, and there was this narrative and there was a, a very strong, you know, core lobby voice that was raising it. But for the rest of us getting on with our lives, didn't really, it just didn't, didn't seem a particularly urgent issue, if I'm honest. Um, you know, we had, you know, more pressing things to worry about in, in, in our communities. Um, and I think like so many, both the... Uh, explanation of the science, you know, the, the complexity of an IPCC report, if you're, you know, not tuned into it, is a little bit terrifying. I still find it quite daunting, if I'm honest. Um, but I have very clever people like my spads to help me understand these things now. But actually, the net, that, that broadening out of the understanding to a much more, um, you know, explanatory narrative, and of course, seeing the impacts. So that exponential curve that, you know, we talk about, uh, and I now understand much better, I can see, you know, I can see it. So, uh, you know, York flooded, Morpeth flooded, in, you know, near where I live, uh, but it was a one in a hundred year event, and then it flooded again five years later. Oh, that's a bit odd. You know, that's sort of one in a hundred. Um, and then we are seeing again and again, you know, in places where there just hasn't been these sorts of extreme weather impacts, uh, you know, they're happening again and again. So have there always been wildfires? Of course they have. But why are they more extreme? Why are they lasting longer? Why are we really struggling to get on top of them? Flooding in places that simply hasn't been an issue. Is that just because we've put a load of concrete down and we could just say, yeah, well, maybe, but also there's more rain. When rain comes, I mean, we've seen it in London in recent weeks, when rain comes, it's like being in the tropics. It's genuinely, I was brought up in London. It didn't used to rain like that in London. It would rain for days and days and days, but it didn't rain like that in raindrops that were the size, you know, could fit in your hand and, you know, filled a street in a matter of seconds. So... I've seen, just like every other normal punter, that actually this is a real and changing set of weather patterns. Uh, I'm no brilliant scientist. I don't understand the complexities. What I can see is the real impacts. What I understand is that the uh, CO2 blankets, how I describe it to children in schools, like blankets wrapping the planet up, and there's too much blanket now. Mm -hmm. And even if we stopped now, and we all stopped putting out CO2, which would involve stopping breathing, so don't do that, um, and everything else, that blanket's there for 100 years. So let's be clear, we've got to do things differently in order to compensate for the impacts that we've had. Uh, so I'm just really, in that sense, I'm a very ordinary person who's been on that journey uh, of suddenly becoming much more aware because it's real. And does that make me, you know, someone who wasn't paying attention? Absolutely. I had small kids and businesses to run like everybody else. And I think what's so interesting is in the last two or three years, and I think that is because of the impacts, you know, that are seen... I mean, in my case, you know, more politically aware and therefore more tuned in and then really investigating and understanding in much more depth uh, both the complexity and the, and the pace of impacts that we're seeing. And obviously in the last year, uh, I've now had the extraordinary opportunity to advocate for so many of these small countries, you know, on a, a global stage to make sure that at COP26 their voices are at the heart of the discussions that say to those who are still pumping out vast amounts of CO2 and other gases into the atmosphere... This cannot go on because the impacts are now becoming regular, extreme, and indeed catastrophic. And, you know, if we consider, you know, what is important as humans at the top of our food chain living on our planet to be respect for others and indeed sustainability, I want this planet to be a wonderful place for my uh, as yet unborn grandchildren. We have to do something about it. My generation, my parents' generation, uh, the one before that didn't understand, didn't think about it, but that massive increase needs to change and it needs to be decarbonized it doesn't need to stop i absolutely don't think we should stop growth we need to do it differently and that's the challenge that we face but it's also an extraordinary as i said opportunity to really drive uh, changes in the way we do business in the way we generate energy and in so many other ways live more sustainably on our planet i have always been very sustainable never had never have pesticides in my veg garden i recycle everything i'm a bit boring like that uh, i have compost heaps um, but that was how I lived. I lived in a little little bubble of sustainability rather than a global bubble. Uh, and uh, now I definitely live in the global bubble. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And, and one a quick a final question from me, because I know you have another commitment, and we, we will have more audience questions.
questions to the rest of the panelists later. Um, so just quickly, what do you most look forward to in your new role and when copy's coming ahead? Um, what's the biggest hope you have or um, optimism that you look forward to? So COP26 is going to be extraordinary. The challenge of getting through a fortnight of conference is a little bit daunting. I mean, we'll all be in a heap by Wednesday, won't we? Uh, but the opportunity to bring the world together uh, with this sense of urgency that is very real everywhere uh, and to really see if we can harness that uh, commitment by everyone to make uh, us move into a different place. I always think if, if the Paris Agreement um, was the why, Glasgow is the how, and that's what we've got to set out. So there's been a huge amount of work led by Alok uh, within the presidency role over the last year in setting out some of the tools that we know we need. But from Glasgow must come delivery of the how. So that's access to finance, that's powering past coal, uh, that's thinking about how uh, countries can see that clean investment come in so that they can build their growth on the back of clean energy. So that for me is, is the outcome. So that's the exciting. What does how look like and can we deliver it? Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. We, we know you need to go, but very happy that you joined us today. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on with the debate. And next up is uh, Catherine Fletcher, who's the MP for South Ribble. And we look forward to your thoughts on this topic and your perspectives from the north of England and your various uh, jobs from Science and Technology Committee, your trade envoy roles, all of the things that you do that are relevant for here. So thank you uh, for being here. Thanks. Right. Welcome to my hometown. Have we got any manks in the house? No. <laughs> Not one mank union in Manchester. Right. They're, 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 they all sound like me, honest. Right. Um, uh, I'm going to come back to that theme of praise at the end of my remarks, but I, I'm not messing. I am extremely proud to be a child of the north of England. I'm also extremely proud to be Alok Sharma's PPS, which is if you're going to carry a bag for someone, one, you <laughs> want to carry it for that bloke, and two, you want to carry it for this project. But um, what I've been asked to talk about is how we can drive net zero um, uh, from the UK perspective. We are an important part. We're a signal sender to the world. Um, you know, the, um, um, the Secretary of State's absolutely spot on. Um, uh, without breaking in any confidences, when the team has been going around the world and, you know, literally living out of a bag for a year to try and bring the world together around COP26 in November, you know, there's a good few ministers in the world that quietly... How have you done it? How have you managed that? The Brits, you've done quite well. How have you managed it? You know, and kind of then it's, oh, right, yes, okay, fine, we'll do it. But we've got a lot to be proud of in that space. So what do I think that the north of England can do to help? Well, partly it's about the geography and the space. In the nicest possible way, you're not going to put a nuclear reactor in central London. Um, um, but you are going to be able to tap into a huge amount of expertise in the northwest of England and the northwest nuclear arc. You know, it goes, if you imagine the top, r top left geography that you are currently proudly situated in, you go from Anglesey all the way across, the, you know, to Charles Finneth in, in northern Wales. You come through Capernurst on the Ellesmere Port Peninsula, which is happily co-located with quite a lot of uh, potential hydrogen sites, CO2 production sites. You might have heard that in the news. We are good at this stuff. And you carry on all the way through to Sellafield and Moorside. And I must give a shout out to the nuclear manufacturing at Springfields in Lancashire which is going to nestle warmly next to the new cyber force center. And I will come back to that as well. But we've got capability in that space. We've got opportunities for hydrogen. We've got, um, we've got pioneering electric vehicles. You hear a lot about the British Vault Factory up in the Northeast, and that's got a huge role to play. But um, South Ripple is a bit of a funny name for a constituency. It's Leyland, it's Penwitham, it's the bit under Preston. So I ran around Leyland Trucks the other day, they have got a commercial electric vehicle. They've got three prototypes. They're selling it. You can go and see it. It's in the. It's you know. It's it's a proper seven and a half tonner. Is it going to go from Glasgow to Glasgow to London and back twice a day? No. But is there a viable in production electric commercial vehicle that's being made in the north of England with expertise that stretches back 150 years? Yeah, totally. So to come back to, and we've also got a lot of holes in the ground. 
Now, those holes in the ground, the, as the Secretary of State referred to, you know, were extracting carbon to help us power the first industrial revolution, along with kind of rain, which stops the cotton thread snapping, if you wonder why Manchester is here. It's here because it rains, not despite the fact it rains, just as a little fact. But those holes in the ground, um, uh, what do we want to put in them? Do we want to pioneer carbon capture and storage? Or do we, in a really lovely irony, want to push geothermal? and start using geothermal and heat networks, and those, those holes that our ancestors put in are going to heat their homes of the future. I don't know. So I'm going to come back to place and people, because we're happily situated in the north of England. And it's not just the geography and the stuff. For me, the biggest thing that the UK can do to drive net zero is what's commonly known as northern nous. So it's that history and that pride in engineering. And I'm going to give you one example, which might be a bit tangential, but this, the UK can, this is an asset for the UK and it's an asset we can export. Global pandemic, you're investing in a massive new manufacturing machine in Chorley. Um, no, the engineers that have made it aren't allowed to travel because it's a red list country. So Gary, and he's a lot younger than the, you actually think in your head when I said Gary, he's probably only in his early 30s just got the manual and decided to work out over about three weeks how to put a multi-million pound machine together to get the manufacturing line going. And that's pride, that's confidence, that's, his, that's years of people going, well, we'll just make it work. Um, and if we can apply that to the net zero problem, then I think both the UK and our role in global trade, as well as the environment, are going to be a better place. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. That's so brilliant. Such good examples of uh, innovation and engineering uh, in the north. We'll continue with the topic of uh, innovation. Uh, welcome Laura Sands, a CEO of Challenging Ideas, and look forward to hearing your thoughts on the topic and energy transition and, and digital and all good things around that. Thank you so much, and thank you, Sen. And wonderful to hear Catherine, because actually, you know, you're going to, people are going to be signing up for inward investment in <coughs> Grand Manchester and a great advert. You'll all make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> for in some ways, what also Anne Marie talked about, which is our <coughs> historical and deep ability to, in many ways, innovate and drive industrial revolutions. And that's what we're, what we're going through at the moment. Um, but we're, in many ways, involved in an industrial revolution that isn't just incremental in addition. We also have to unwind some of the current practices that we have. And I think that's actually where the real friction lies, rather than the innovation. In, in a strange way. So it's the re-engineering that's the problem rather than the aspirational innovation. But as Anne-Marie said, time is running out and time is running out on climate, but it is also running out on our competitive advantage because in many ways, you know, we have absolutely deployed huge amount of renewables. We've done all sorts of exciting stuff, but sometimes we haven't really lent in to the export opportunity, the scale-up opportunity. And pulling again on one of Anne-Marie's points, and that is, we do know what we need to do, more or less. There are one or two limited moonshot innovations. Now what we've got to do is how we deploy it. And actually, this is a different sort of innovation. It's not the innovation um, of, I've come up with this extraordinary iPhone, or I've developed this whole new um, sort of technology. What it is, it's the innovation of business. It's the innovation of deployment, of scale up, of new business models. And I've come back to the new business models. It's exactly also what Amory says, it's the deployment of the capital in the right place at the right time. And in many ways, this is absolutely crucial for government to unlock, but it is absolutely for business to deliver. Um, I do a lot of work in, in the digital world, and energy decarbonisation and the digital world is actually conflating quite significantly. And so I think that we've got a huge opportunity there because we are leaders. In, uh, we're, we're not gl the global leader, but we are one of the global leaders in the digital world, and we can bring that together with the carbon and uh, the sort of carbon accounting and border adjustment. And we also have another area of importance. 
just to finish off on one key element, and really, if Anne Marie was here, it would be sort of more directed at her or her uh, her department. And that is that we always look at things like fantastic, you know, we know how to do the, the, the sexiest wind, f wind turbine, or we know how to do the most efficient X, Y, and Z piece of technology. I come back to services. When we're exporting, we should be really focusing on our service area. And our service area are people like Arup, all the engineering services companies. We absolutely, when you look at the first industrial revolution, we didn't build the railways in Chile. We designed them. We, in many ways, shaped the business model. We developed them. And then other people actually physically built them. And so I think we've got to see that those services, that expertise, the brain, not just the brawn, of this huge industrial opportunity is very, very strong in this country. And once you get those services exporting to all parts of the world, actually designing this new net zero world, they will bring along with them all these great innovators and also the technologies that come from our experience. I think we should be super optimistic but we've got to be really, really focused, and we've got to stop, in many ways, focusing on anything that is carbon intensive and really put all government's weight, embassies' weights, and trade, body, trade bodies' weights behind the decarbonisation, what's called the future economy. So it's exciting. Thank you, Laura. I really like that take on innovation, not just being uh, technology and, and new products, but actually the whole policy, regulatory, finance, business model innovation. And there's so much, I think, people in this audience involved in that space will, will help us uh, deliver that. Now, final speaker uh, is uh, Dominic Quinnell, who's CEO of Enetechnos, uh, who are kindly sponsoring today's event. And you are from uh, a clean tech company in the electricity distribution and transmission sector. So really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on, from a business perspective, all the trials and tribulations that you have had building up a business and looking at growth and export opportunities. So thank you so much for being here. Well, <coughs> thank, thank you, Rosa, for the, for the introduction. And, uh, I will say that I, I find it quite a tough act to follow the last three speakers. They've all been absolutely fabulous. Um, just a, a quick word about what we're, what we're doing here. Um, what, what our company does is we have designed better forms of, of uh, electrical cable to lose less of the energy that gets generated. And the reason why that's important, the IEA, the International en Energy Agency, put out a report a couple of years ago saying that approximately one gigaton of CO2 is emitted each year through losses in transmission and distribution. And that is an absolutely humongous amount, and it's such a big target to attack. Now, in the UK, we lose about 8.6% of all the energy that we generate before it gets from the generation point to, to the consumer. And some of that is unfixable because it's, it's resistance. But some of it can be fixed, and we've approached this by, by redesigning the cable. And our approach has been, as well, to license that technology. So this speaks very much to Laura's point about services, um, and it's a, it's a global licensing opportunity that the UK can take out there. But you know, one of the things that we're talking about here today is innovation and also a, you know, clean, fair trade, and you can't have the clean, fair trade without the innovation in the first place. And I think it's, it's worth reflecting on the role of business in, in innovation um, and, and how it can be helped by government. Because you know, we set out on this journey seven or eight years ago, and it's taken us this long to get to the point where we're just about to put the first piece of cable in the ground <coughs> with, a, with one of the DNOs. And that's been hard. You know, we've raised money from private investors, and we've had good support, really good support, from Innovate UK and also from Bayes. And one of the things that I think the, the government has done, and I really hope it continues to do, is to give the, the support for seed investments like ours by the SEIS and EIS tax mechanism. Because if I had a pound for every time I've been and talked to a venture capitalist or private equity person who said, come back and talk to us when you've got a million pounds of turnover and I'll give you all the money you want, I'd be a wealthy man. And my answer is always the same to them. If, if I had that million of turnover, I wouldn't <laughs> be talking to you in the first place. So. The, the EIS or SEIS has been really, really valuable. 
and and we, we, we massively appreciate that. I think the the other thing is is to recognize the scale of the challenge of, of decarbonization. Um, looking at the UK, you know, in, in 1970, 50 years ago, we had about 30% of the homes had central heating. Now it's what, 95% and it's almost all gas. But we have now to do a pivot and very quickly change that. And, and that's going to take a huge amount of effort. Um, if you look in the same period of time, we've grown from 20 million cars to 33 million cars on the roads. And now we're trying to flip those cars from being you know, fueled by carbon to being fueled by hopefully clean electricity and that's that's something by the way that we're we're really passionate about but we're also very alive to the difficulty of getting that energy to where it's needed through the grid because the grid that we have at the moment was designed to distribute centrally generated carbon fuel power and now we have already in the UK over a million different sources of energy feeding into the grid from people's um, solar panels on their roofs, from wind farms and so on. We have more and more offshore wind coming onshore, which is, which is fantastic. And we have the, the nuclear that we're going to need to have for baseload. But all of that generation is for naught if we can't get the energy where it's needed. And that's really, really important because if everybody starts plugging in their cars at the same time, we know what's going to happen. I mean, already there are, there's talk about um, having to have a smart meter if you have a, a home charger and it's going to be shut off for nine hours of the day. Well, that's not really helpful for people who are on shift work, come back, and they need to charge then. So having central government saying, sorry, you can't, is, is extremely unhelpful. So I think we need to look at all of these things in the, in the, in the round. Um, I think that the, the regulators need really to get on board with this as well. Ofgem has moved a long way in the last couple of years. I mean, you know, as uh, a business, we've been sitting on one of their working groups on the environment. And you know, five years ago, it was almost impossible to get Ofgem to agree to let uh, the DNOs, the distribution network operators, invest ahead of need. Anticipatory investment they, they didn't like because they were terrified of, of, of stranded assets. And they have shifted that position I think that there's, there's still more work that can be done there. They need to get a little bit bolder. They need to, have to be more welcoming of innovation, more supportive of innovation. Grids are incredibly um, small C conservative organizations. So that's, that's something I think where we can, we can help to get some, some uh, signals from central government really. Um, I think that the policy makers in innovation and decarbonization need to be looking ahead at the evolution of technology and also to the changing demand. And this is really, really important. Um, a statistic came out the other day from Bloomberg who did a study of electric vehicles and they forecast that in 2040, electric vehicles alone will need 6,000 terawatt hours of energy. To put that into perspective, the entire UK economy last year was 286. <laughs> so that energy has got to be generated, it must be generated cleanly and it must be distributed. So the, the demand is something that people really, really need to be alive to. Um, I talked a bit about the, the um, continued financial support for innovation that, that we've had, and certainly EIS, SEIS is, is incredibly valuable. I think that anything that the government can look at to simplify the process of running some of those things would be really welcome as a, as a company. We reckon that on the, the, the last um, government-sponsored piece of work we did, where it was 45% provided by the government, the funding, and the rest by us, we spent about a third of the cost of that on administration. And, and we really would have rather have spent that on, on engineering and innovation. So that's something which I think we, we, we could do. But look, I think in agreement with everybody on the panel, the UK is an incredibly strong, it, it's in a strong position from the point of view of innovation, we have the innovators here. Um, we have wonderful people who are going abroad um, to interesting and exotic places like Mozambique. Um, <laughs> to who, and I hope that you can find some people in the Mozambique grid and let's talk about it. But you know, I think we, we, we have a great message to deliver. We have a great history of innovation in this country. We're changing the way that we do it, but it's really important that we continue to do it.
thank you. That's really insightful to hear of those, uh, you know, Innovate UK support and the government tax schemes that have helped uh, a growing business and also some of the red tape that's uh, adding costs where it, where it doesn't need to be. But um, if, if you could just say, do you have uh, international ambitions and uh, kind of is there any kind of international support? Obviously, the Secretary of State has left, but if, uh, if she was still in the room, would there be anything that you would say that would help you grow and export the cabling technology as well? Well, <coughs> I think the first thing I'd like to say is that there is already very good support. You know, the Department for International Trade has done a great job. They've, they've got us in front of people in the United States, in Japan, and it's a, it's a continuing debate. So there is, there is already plenty of that going on. I think that, it's, you know, that there could always be more, um, but on the whole, we have found them responsive and, and, and very, very productive in what, what help they provide. Um, I think otherwise, um, you know, we, we need to hire more good people, um, and that is always a challenge for us, finding the right people um, who can go and explain what we do, because our, our business is quite complex. We have, first of all, to persuade the people who are using the cables, and then we have to persuade the cable companies to take out a license to manufacture it for them. Um, and it's unfortunately true that there's not much cable manufacturing done in this country. JDR, of course, has just done a, a great job in launching the, the new facility in Blythe in Northumberland. But there aren't many others, and it's, 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 which is a shame. Um, so anything that um, anybody can do to help us with, with getting in front of more international audiences, we'll, we'll always talk to them. Yeah. I'd just add the UK export finance. We don't talk about it enough. I know it's not directly related, but very short version. There is an organisation that is helping um, businesses like Dominic's and, and others actually fund the, um, the cash flow to get the export contracts in the first place, and it's a real game changer. So it um, doesn't touch fossil fuels uh, because the government's changed policy, but when you go out and talk about what UK EF can do to support British companies sell into markets around green, clean, it's really interesting. Catherine, can I also ask uh, your experience from your constituents, uh, businesses and, and innovators? Are there um, kind of, do you hear feedback from on kind of government support on uh, net zero innovation, um, trade? Uh, any do you, do you have kind of uh, representations from businesses in your area? What, what, what's in their mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th th the reason I know about the, um, the the newly launched truck is I went around uh, Leyland factory. Um, uh, th there is there is a there is a <laughs> I ch you know the um, you know the uh, the Isle of um, the chessmen that got that got found carved out of whalebone, and you know the one that's the berserker that's shield shield chewing. There's quite a lot of shield chewing going on in the north of England to just get on with it. It's kind of Dominic's put it very beautifully, but people just really want to crack on. They want to know what the sites are. They want to have some certainty. They you you know they there is a genuine energy. So the vast majority of it is not necessarily you need to make this go away or you need to do that. It's like, can we go on with it? Genuinely. And so actually, it's a little bit like, well, you know, don't get government in the way of that. Just provide the channels to get on with it and give the opportunities. And then like the, there's a load of dip people out on the ground and, you know, s encouraging people to thinking about exporting, be that services or goods. It's really interesting to talk to them. And then the rest of it is more a little bit of seed capital, tiny bits of pump prime private investment. And um, I would say there's a lot of empty roundabouts in, in, in kind of South Ribble, Leyland. We'd be delighted to put a cable factory on there if you wanted one. Um, <laughs> just while we're doing a little bit of that. You, you hear, it, hear it here first. Uh, deals, deals being yeah, yeah. struck and uh, send panel. Um, it's, it's not really yeah. right, so. Laura, is that your your view as well? Um, sort of, does government need to get uh, get out of the way? And there is actually a lot of uh, enthusiasm. Or wh where do you see we need more involvement and not less? Well, I think that the government plays a huge part in what I call conducting the orchestra, but not playing the instruments, mm -hmm. right? Really quite important. And I absolutely pick up on Catherine's point about the um, export guarantee schemes and that. I, I'm not sure it's very easily curated for a company that wants to scale up. And I think picking up absolutely on your point, on this issue about the cost of accessing, and it's not really the cost in the sense you're paying out money, but you're employing staff, there's bureaucracy, there's all of this there. So I think that that can be streamlined, and it needs to be very customer-focused, i.e., 
business focus and streamlined through so that in some ways the, the journey is very much curated by government rather than the company having to navigate. But there is something really problematic, and I, I don't know whether other business people in this room have experienced it, and that is that there is a breed of what you might call innovation junkies, right? And Innovate UK actually gives a shed load of money, and it's fantastic. And they're doing some really, really exciting stuff. But there are companies that actually are not building business models. They are building tender capacity for the innovation pots, right? and particularly in the energy sector, and I'm sure, Dominic, actually you recognize this as well. You've got some fabulous pilots, and they've all been proven to be great, and then they die. Because nobody is actually funding the scale-up, the deployment. And Dominic's point about the regulator being aligned with these innovations, everybody says how clever we are, and then we forget what we've actually achieved. And five years later, I have seen innovations that have been funded by us, the taxpayer, that actually replicate something that five years ago had already been done and proven. So even institutional memory isn't there. But it's about getting stuff out there. And it's also about making mistakes. And that government also finds difficult, and I really understand that. But, you know, innovation is messy. And every failure is the start of a new success. So I think there needs to be a bit more courage, bravery, which is difficult. But maybe you actually brand an innovation fund, you know, called the Brave Fund or um, Courage at Heart or something really like that, which actually in its remit is allowed to fail. Yeah. Or the Northern Grit Zone. There you go. It I think exists. we've done it. We've, no, no, no. we've <laughs> given birth to a... It exists. Oh, tell yeah, us. So the Northern, Grit, the Northern Gritstone Investment Fund is effectively that. So it's the universities of Manchester and Sheffield, and right. I'm, I'm going to forget some, and someone's yeah. going to get cross with me in this room. I apologise. And it's basically drag getting institutional investors to get outside of the golden triangle between London, London and Cambridge, and you know, see our specialisms in advanced manufacturing yeah, and yeah, make and and so and it's drawing in private capital to take a risk, which is why it's called Northern Gritstone. It's honestly, it's ace. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Dominic. Excellent. <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on to audience uh, Q&A now, and we will have the microphone. Uh, can we start? There's a question at the back, and because the microphone is at the back, then we move forward uh, from, so yeah. Hi, um, my name's Steve. Um, I mean, this, this conversation is really, really interesting, and um, one of the problems, that we're trying to seek some funding at the moment for business model for geothermal battery storage, and we are talking to banks, and we're asking the question, what would make you invest? They're really quite nervous investing in new technologies. Um, and one of the proposals they have come up with is actually is an underwriting scheme for the government. It's a bit like the mortgage scheme for new first-time buyers. So government underwriting the loans for the private sector to release the money. And I wonder what the panel thinks about that. And um, I've got some information for you on geothermal. If that would be interested in, we'll drop you a piece over. Um, so uh, these, there's a lovely organisation called the Northwest Business Leadership Team, and the things we've been, I've been talking to them, along with Cheshire colleagues that are talking to the high net people, about this this financing gap, because what we you know people are only going to one route, so that so the, uh, the banks have a very reasonable suggestion, but what then it's not joined up in the landscape, so they don't know that there's this other route and this is other route. So apart from anything else, perhaps go and talk to the Northwest Business Leadership Team, Bacon, Lettuce and Tomato, because they are actually looking to join up and describe our existing investment and make the handoffs much better between the banks and the public and the private sector. And, they've, they've, and, and to close exactly the gap, that sub-million investability threshold where it's really hard to get someone up on a train from London. Um, uh, I won't crap on, but yeah, cool. One of the other panelists want to come on. Can I actually ask you a question? Because what you've just said is geothermal and storage. And what I'm finding also very difficult that 
government, but actually regulators in particular and innovation, what they want is they want one technology. Oh, right, so I'm in geothermal, or I'm in storage, or I'm in this, or I'm in that. And when you end up actually building what I would call a blended business model that actually really works because actually it gives you ultimately firm power rather than intermittent, they say, oh, but which technology am I investing in? And I just wonder whether we've got the sophistication to understand your blended business model, right? We, it's we an outcome. Yeah. It's an outcome, not a technology. With, uh, with the position we're in, uh, in January, we took over one of the extracting companies in the north of England. Um, and we have the generating station. So we're now cleaned off the fossil fuel infrastructure. We're looking at uh, the wells, what could we can do with geothermal. So it's for local growing around geothermal, for instance. But we're also looking at 100 megawatt batteries. We're also looking at solar. And we're looking to use as an innovation testing bed to see which technology is the best. So we're at that stage at the moment. So we are talking to UKIB and people like that as well, because it fits in really well their narrative. A and it's an opportunity here to show a transition model, um, which, you know, we're at that point now. But what we're finding is when you talk to the banks, we're not sure yet. That technology makes us a bit nervous. They're happy with solar, but when the batteries, and geothermal and everything else. Yeah. Great. Shall we take more questions from the audience? There were a few hands up. So should we? Uh, the gentleman at the front had a hand up for quite early on. We'll do uh, take that one, and then we'll come back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Councillor Ankur Bhandari from Bracknell Forest Council, and also a business owner. So we have signed up to the pledge of net zero at the council by 2050. And it was interesting to hear the Secretary of State talking about a further commitment of reduction of 78% by 2035 versus 1990. Mm -hmm. Now, I find myself similar to what she said 10, 12 years ago. You know, she was on the journey. I think I'm still on that journey, trying to understand and all this technology is very foreign to me, the terminology that you're using. What I am concerned about when I speak to my residents is, yes, we are talking 2050 and all of that. What are the risks you see to that? I mean, I've just been enlightened about this potential finance risk and you know, so maybe, you know, Catherine, leading with you, what are the top two or three risks? Because it is a huge change from where we are to where we are going. So, so you know, what are the top two or three risks that you see uh, in us not being able to, or potentially a risk to that target of net zero by 2050? So effectively, the risks of not delivering net zero. So I don't know whether you saw the, the very latest um, uh, climate change report that came out. It was talking about the red lights flashing on the dashboard. Within that, that didn't generate as many headlines, was an analysis of the financial cost if we just let global warming rip. And it makes the pandemic look like a piece of cake. Because how much money is it going to paint where, uh, you know, when everyone's flooding? or where we've got mass movements of people because marginal land is not viable anymore, or where you're losing large chunks of coastal communities, not necessarily in the UK. And so I think the first thing is, is we're not in a state, it's not status quo. This, the exponential curve that Secretary of State talked about is happening. We, I mean, I am a biologist by background, so I was on the train a bit earlier, but just because it's obvious in the numbers, it's happening. So the status quo is not an option. We can let it rip, but it will actually cost us more if you just want to take all of the human being stuff out, the adaptation and mitigation of two and a half degrees sea warming or three degrees sea warming, which is where we're heading for if we don't change now, is... 10 times what it's cost the world the pandemic. So I think, I don't think you need two or three risks. That's the one. I think the, the, the only other risk that I would, is one of timing, because when people really start to understand the scale of what we've got to do, everybody panics and thinks we've got to do it by next Wednesday. Well, of course we haven't. We can't afford it. We, that's not how you use it. We need, you know, it's going to be a longer term change. And the key is net in net zero. So it's an aggressive target. I mean, it's world leading. 78% reduction in carbon emissions on 1990 levels by 2035. It's going to be spicy to do. Um, but it, that's not full on net zero tomorrow. So I think the risks are timing and sequencing. And that's why I would highlight Northern Nelfs and, and engineering brilliance, because it's not the obvious stuff. A, a gigaton? Gigawatt? Yes, gigaton. A, gi a, a gigaton. Excellent. There was a, oh, Laura, do you want to go? Yeah. I just want to say I um, absolutely understand exactly 
where you're coming from and also who you're communicating with. These are, the, you know, these are your constituents, these are the people you represent. And um, I was involved with something, that the I, an, another think tank, uh, um, uh, the IPPR, which was actually talking to those communities in this country that are going to be most affected by our plans to decarbonize. So the oil and gas, Aberdeen, you know, all of these areas, right? And actually, one of the things that came out really, really strongly, and that is that nothing should be done to people, and that we need, through transformation, we need to have a much, much more, in many ways, bottom-up approach, and every location will have a little bit of a different nuance in terms of solution. So it is about, in many ways, giving some of, some of the reins to the public and allowing them to shape it. It is essential, and we are starting which, what I would call putting the rubber on the road, and that is we're going to start moving into people's homes. Okay, this is, this is not, you know, it's fine all that offshore wind farm stuff because, you know, <laughs> I live in central, you know, England, I can't see it, right? This is now going to start to get personal. And the personal side is going to require a very different approach, and I think we're going to have to change ourselves from thinking about engineers and all of that clunky stuff to how are we going to design beautiful heat pumps. Have you seen a heat pump recently? They are disgusting, right? This yeah, is a... Well, this is their big air conditioning units. But, but, but what, what we're going to have to do is change the way we are actually engaging. And so I give, you, I give you one thing, and that is I would say that climate change is a massive health and safety issue. And how many people get into their car without their seat belts on? We'll do one more quick audience question. There was a hand sort of in the middle there before, but if you still have a question, put it up. Or someone else, if you have a, quest a quick question, there's one there, and we'll do that quickly, and then we'll have a quick closing comments from the panel. Hi, uh, Nick King from the Energy Research Accelerator. So just going back to the minister's um, target of reducing uh, emissions by 78%, um, obviously it's going to take a step change in innovation, in terms of infrastructure, skills. What are the two or three things that you think the government should do in order to, to ensure that we, we hit those targets by 2035? Who wants to go? Start on that end. Yeah. Start on that end. Um, yeah. Two or three things, gosh. Um, I, I, th I think the, th the real th first thing to do is to start acting now on a lot of the infrastructure that we're going to need because uh, the renewable energy that comes on stream um, is, 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 as I said in, in my earlier remarks, no good to anybody if you can't get to where people need it. And I think that there really has to be a recognition and uh, a, a speedier recognition of starting to make the changes now to get ready for where you want to be in 10 years' time. Because um, you know, if you look at charging electric vehicles, which again I referred to, we've seen very vividly in the last few, few days what happens and how anxious people get when they can't get the fuel they want for their cars. But if you've got 14 million electric vehicles in 2030 that can't get the energy they need, imagine what's going to happen and what it's going to do sort of socially, um, let alone to the, econom you know, the, the economy of people not being able to get to work. So I, th I think, f for me, number one uh, from, the, from the government is act soon. Great, thank you. And we are approaching the end, so we'll just do a, a quick uh, final question from me uh, to all the panelists. So it's been a really broad discussion, and we've heard so many interesting things. It's been it's covered everything and anything. Uh, so could you say if there was something you heard in today's debate from fellow panelists or, or someone from the audience that made you kind of reflect on this topic and anything you, you take away from, from it for your work or uh, policy initiatives? So... Uh, should we start at this end and work our way down the panel? Thank you, Rosa, and thank you so much for this great, great uh, event. Um, I take away what, what Catherine said about the ingenuity and the drive of our existing industrial base and how that can be really, not easily, but with some support can be repurposed to a really exciting future. And in many ways, psychologically, I think, has been our problem because we've seen all of these industries oh, all on their way down, they we're all deindustrializing. It doesn't mean to say that 
the expertise, the spirit, the innovation, and the potential right. is all there, yeah. and it needs watering. It's like a, yeah. you know, yeah. Oh, sorry, me. Right, sorry. Um, yeah, forgive me. I was just reflecting on that. That's really, I'm nicking that, actually, <laughs> if that's all right. I'm nicking that analogy, because the pride does just need watering. You know, I, I've lost count on the amount of people oh, that are making uh, a quarter-inch milled steel steam engines, you know, to 112 scale, and then they're going and working in a marketing department. But they've got that skill set, you know, exactly. Um, the thing I will take from it is the ability... You know, they're just making it in their shed. Don't knock what's going on in northern sheds, I'm telling you. <laughs> The, the thing I will take <laughs> is that you hear a lot in the press, oh, my God, we've got to do so many things. It's concerning for, I hear people, I have people coming in saying, you know, the Im impacts on my life to achieve this net zero, are we sure we need to do it? And it's very easy for us to focus on the tangible, we've got to do the boiler, we've got to do the car. But the amount of, you know, we are already 40% less, 40% 40, 40 less, uh, you know, well, hardly any coal. We've grown by 75% our economy. And the thing I will take is the scale of the levers that we can pull behind the scenes that aren't flashy, if we're careful. Yeah. A gigaton is a lot. So that's what I'm going to take. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish, I, I wish I'd, I'd come up with that gigaton thing myself, but I, sh I shamelessly nick it and use it all the time. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I think that the, the services and the expertise that we have in this country is, is, is what's been emphasized a lot in this discussion. And, and the ability to innovate and to take that abroad. And I think that we can do so much with that. We can be leaders um, in, in, in a lot of the technology. And just to, to um, borrow one of Catherine's words, you know, the, the unflashy stuff, uh, th there's, it's really, really important that the unflashy stuff gets paid attention to because you know, if you look at uh, transmission and distribution grid losses, in the UK, it's 1.5% of all this country's CO2 emissions are entirely down to losses in transmission and distribution. We all get excited about aviation. It's naughty. We wag our fingers and say, well, it's, it's 2 two or 3%. But 1.5%, come on, people, we can do something about that. So let's do it. Okay. Thank you so much, all the panellists. This was really entertaining and informative uh, panel. And thank you, Enna Technos, for sponsoring. It's been real, real pleasure. Yeah. Um, and thank you to all of you for listening. And if you would like to listen to more Send Talks, we've got another one coming up uh, soon on Blue Planet. So stay in for that if you're interested uh, in oceans. And if you would like to sign up to be more involved in Send's work, then uh, you can sign up as Send Supporter on our website, or we've got some uh, um, sort of leaflets around where you can sign up too. So look forward to seeing you again at Send events, and thank you for attending, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Nice, that was fun.